Of course, Alan Quinlan, good morning to you. How are you? Morning, lads. How are you? How do you like them apples? Oh, yeah, it was fantastic. Um, I suppose we're all all surprised by the dominance. I I, um, I certainly believed it was a good performance in Ireland that, that they would, um, you know, play with fire and spirit and a real determination. But um, it's the accuracy, I suppose, and, and the way they execute us and, and the tactics they use throughout the game, I think, were, which were most impressive. Listen to Andy Dunn speaking about it afterwards, and that podcast is up on the OTV Podcast Network. He was saying that um, the number of rooks that we had was far fewer than we've had traditionally at the end of the Joe Schmidt era, and that that's a clear evolution in what the team are trying to do from an attacking perspective. That's what we wanted to see, really, was like, what does the Andy Farrell, Mike Catt, Paul O'Connell, Simon Easterby and this crew, what does their team look like? And obviously that's a gr brilliant performance, but there's, there's a science behind it and there's an architecture behind it that suggests they're trying to do something slightly different. Um, yeah, I suppose we've probably looking back overall at the tournaments, um, their success rate at the breakdown has been the most impressive. I think we've seen glimpses of, of the efficiency that they, they had under Joe Schmidt. Um, it went awry for a while. Um, and you know, the way they, if you continuously hold on to the ball and again, they had more possession on Saturday against England and that's, they've had that in the five games, more possession in the opposition and if you're at least holding on to the ball, you're 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 gonna get a chance to try and do things with it. And you know, we've seen glimpses throughout the tournament that they're trying to uh, put more attack and more variety in, in their attack. But it was probably the execution that let them down in those first two games, and and that was probably lines of running and just timing of passes and stuff like that. A lot of teams are fanning out across the field so you've got to find a way to get through the, the little space and in tight channels and stuff like that and when you get into multi-phase we didn't see that in Murrayfield last week Ireland getting into enough multi-phase and building a high number of phases so that's probably what frustrated and asked a lot of those question marks last week about the attack and closing out the game but um, one thing I picked up on throughout the whole tournament and, and I suppose you can put a positive spin on it when you're in the group and I've been there myself. You're trying to block out the negativity from the outside, but you're trying to get messages out that we do believe in ourselves and we do think we're on the right track. And they've continually said that. And they probably proved it because you couldn't have produced a performance like that if their confidence was very, very low. Of course, there's pressure and there's always pressure from match to match at that level. But I think they obviously believed in themselves and... and because you can't, you can't produce a performance like that on Saturday if you don't believe in yourself, if you don't have that confidence. If, because you see evidence in training, Ger, of things actually coming uh, really good. And when you look back at videos, you think if you can find the little situations where somebody should have given a pass or kept the ball alive, and you can highlight that. And, you know, I think Ireland have got better throughout the tournament. And, I've always said this about the Six Nations. Sometimes it just hits you with a bang in that first game and you've got to be up and running. And it's hard to do that because of cohesion and lack of time together and all that stuff. So um, they've certainly improved. And But another telling stat that, um, and, you know, stats sometimes can hide, hide things because when I say territory possession, in the first two games against Wales and France, if you look at the territory and possession Ireland have, um, lots of other stats throughout those games you think how how do they lose those matches but it's just execution and it's finding in those tight games finding an opportunity to get a seven pointer to score tries and they did that brilliantly at the start on saturday it's a hammer blow to the opposition with keith earl's try and then the try before half time incredible 24 or five phases and um the execution and the clean outs at the breakdown and the patience was just phenomenal so many great performances. Let's let's tease through them because um, Ty Byrne, definitely, potentially Irish player of the tournament. It's him or, I mean, I think you've, you've got to have sex in the conversation and Robbie Henshaw as well. They were all sensational. But where does Ty Byrne play for Ireland? Is it like wherever he wants, wherever you need him? Is that is that it now? It's like first name on the team sheet wherever there's a gap. Yeah, um, it depends. Like if James Ryan is back in, in, in the second round, I thought Ian Henderson had a really good tournament for a guy who was undercooked coming into it. Um, so Byrne has gone to a level now where you have to select him. 
he's I think he in Jack for Jack Conan's try. I think he carried the ball four times and in, in, in throughout the phases there. Um, a phenomenal score just before half time. Um, the way Ireland kept the ball and he was big in that. Stander was big. Furlong, yeah, um, lots lots of big plays. Keen Healy made a couple of big carries there. Sexton carried the ball three or four times himself and was the you know cross field kick interlinking and he's passing Stockdale twice. Keenan twice, Aki carried it, was a link player at one stage, she was scrum half, Jack Conan carried it three times, you know, it's so many big involvements there, and Byrne was 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 one that, you know, just continuously throughout the whole tournament and throughout this whole game, he's with without the ball, um, he's devastating, so to answer the question, if, if James Ryan is fit, James Ryan and Henderson start the second row because their form was very good throughout this tournament as well. And Byrne has to play in the back row then. Um, there was a concern and worry going into the game that, you know, is is he powerful enough for the second row? Is he a big second row? He's not a huge second row. He's still a very big man. And he's proved that he can do the job there now. So he, he, was, he was fantastic. As Robbie Henshaw was throughout the tournament, I think if you were to pick the two best players for Ireland throughout the tournament. It was it was then followed up by Keith Earls with his performance last week, this week. Johnny Sexton, I think, has been absolutely brilliant. And to see him finishing games as well, it's uh it's it's great to see. So a lot of the older players, Ty Furlong, brilliant as well. And uh, the stat I forgot was you know, fifty four lineouts in, in the tournament and they lost six. Um, it's unbelievable, you know, to lose six. Scotland lost six lineouts alone last week against Ireland. To win fifty-four line, to have fifty-four lineouts and only lose six, is um, is brilliant. So, you know, having that possession and ability to keep the ball, um, there's still facets of the game that uh, need to get a lot better. You know, I think even the attack. Uh, and the execution and the timing of passes, all that kind of stuff, needs needs to be better. Um, and there's 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 a little bit of uh, you know they got the emotion right and why wouldn't you you know what I mean your back is to the wall really you lose the game Saturday and they're they're in a really bad place and people will keep more pressure on them so it's easy to get up for that game but I think the calmness and the control was 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 really impressive as well the way they were able to deliver and you know when Bundyaki got sent off I felt nervous I felt England will have a surge. They scored straight away, pretty much straight away after the sending off. But then Ireland just took control again, and and they just went to a different level. So it was a it was an, a phenomenal performance. They've got to try and build on that now and and keep that standard for for as long as possible. It seems that you're pretty confident on where Ty Byrne should play over the course of the next little while. But on Robbie Henshaw, is it a little less clear at this point because? I guess there was some suggestion last week that maybe Chris Farrell goes in because he's more of a 13 and you can just keep Henshaw at 12. Henshaw moves to 13 and plays out of his skin. Does that blow the whole conversation wide open now? Yeah, um, it does. But look, we've there's been a fair bit of chopping and changing in the centre partnerships in the last couple of years on. And uh, mm. look, you, you can't mask over the fact that we, we've looked at a lot of games that Ireland have struggled in and our centre partnership haven't been... Um, they're brilliant individual players, but there just hasn't been that real kind of natural flow to what they're doing. And you know, you go, do you go back to Bundyaki now and, and Robbie Henshaw? And well, I suppose you're only as good as your last game, and that game, both of them were brilliant. I think that you know, obviously, um, for Bundyaki getting this, getting sent off was was incredibly disappointing personally for him because. I thought it was a harsh one, even though, look, letter to law, um, it's it's it, there's contact there. But I thought he was brilliant as well, Aki, and he kind of laid down a marker of of uh, with his performance. Um, Chris Farrell last week, I was thinking play Chris Farrell and and, and try and get him into the team because he's a very good passer. So they've got to keep working on it and try and you know understand. One bad performance again. If we had another match next week, we you know it it opens up a can of worms again. But hopefully they'll have a summer tour now. But uh, I don't know. Henshaw was brilliant at twelve, and then he moves to thirteen, and he's brilliant. So that would suggest that 
he has to start whether it's 12 or 13 and hopefully Gary Ringrose will find his form. Gary Ringrose is too good a player to leave out of the Irish team. Um, his form has been been dipped. Uh, so they're all very, very good players but I think it's down to it's down to Mike Cat and the way they play and finding the best players to do that job because I think they can all do a job and going back to the World Cup when Chris Farrell came on against Scotland he was brilliant so he's a very good player as well. There's four of them there and um, they're all top class players. You could end up playing uh, Henshaw and Aki together and having a Gary Ringrose on the wing or as a full back or something like that. Who knows, depending on injuries and who's available. But um, you have to try and find a position and get Gary Ringrose out in the field because when the game opens up, he's, he's devastating and can be devastating. And can be brilliant in defence as well, and is brilliant in defence. And that, like that, that's one of the other things that popped up at the weekend. Alan was the individual brilliance when England had the ball from Henshaw again. Was that down to him just being in unbelievable form, or was it down to a defensive form uh, itself or a defensive system itself? What well, What was the the, the newest uh, development you saw well, like, on Saturday? Well, what, 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 like I say, you you try and fix these things as as and when you're in the in that in the group and you look back in the videos and I think Simon Eastby deserves a huge amount of credit for that. The way they defended against England, the way they, you know, won a lot of those collisions. They stopped England getting over the game line. You know, Billy Vunapola tried to carry a lot and he just got stopped at source. Um, you're always going to get a team that get a yard or two here and there, but the vast majority of the time, Ireland stayed very well connected in defence. They weren't as passive as they were um, against Scotland last week, particularly in the last 15 minutes last weekend in Murrayfields. Um, so they would have looked at that. Plus, we hadn't individual errors. We hadn't guys shooting out of the line. There wasn't a disconnect. There wasn't... They looked like they were solid together. They knew what the inside defender was doing. Um, obviously, with no crowd there, and you, I'm there doing the commentary, you, you can hear the communication and nominating players in defence. And, and uh, you know, that that was impressive. So Simon Easterby got it right as well with his defence on Saturday, and he deserves credit for that. But, you know, good players can see this stuff and know the mistakes. You know, you, you step in or you step out of the line in a match... You know yourself as a player. Players inside or outside, you'll let you know as well when you mess up. So they've sorted that out themselves. And um, so it wasn't that an, any huge, huge change that we'd seen. Or probably the change we saw on Saturday was better connection and defence and getting off the line quicker. But again, it's something, if, if they didn't do that against England, particularly when they're under pressure in that first 15 minutes, um, England would have really punished them and hurt them. So they stopped England. And then they made good reads with Robbie Henshaw, that little wraparound play where he smothers up George Ford. They're telling moments in a match. And uh, you could see the reaction from the Irish players. Even a couple of times they held them up in malls uh, in the tackle and, and got turnovers from a mall. Um, it all went pretty well for them. What next? What what what's the you know what's the bit of evolution that comes next to make sure that this isn't one of those uh, little isolated islands of victories that we have you know because Irish rugby is full of these and we were talking about this a little bit earlier on you know where next year is our traditional year where we do really well maybe we win a Grand Slam the year before World Cup and uh, think that all the world is amazing but what's what's the next stage where this we wanted progress in terms of the game plan we wanted strength and depth we wanted some evolution and we've got. You know, you, you're you're definitely leaning towards a, a positive report card for the management structure and for the uh, leadership group and for some of the young players coming through. So, what's next for this team? What's next is to try and get more play players into the squad and caps. I think nine and ten are still the depth chart there. Um, a lot of uncertainty there. You know, Sexton goes off early in that game on Saturday. It's a different story, maybe. Billy Burns, could he cope with that pressure? Maybe he could when he comes on. But there's, there's the reality is there's a difference there. Um, you know, Gibson Park has shown glimpses throughout the tournament and he's very, very good uh, sniping with the ball, um, taking a step off, off, the, off the breakdown. Conor Murray did what you want him to do on Saturday perfectly. Just got the ball away into Sexton's hands quickly. Um kicked really well but you know if, if those players are out and both were missing against France it's a different story unfortunately their leadership as well so 
for Andy Farrell, it's developing more leaders. Um, that game is a huge game. You you can get so much confidence and self belief, and look back on that. But they've got to use it now in the right way. You've got to get Carberry back in the squad. Um, can Craig Casey step up to the next level, um, and and get consistency there and be a real kind of challenger for that number nine for Ireland? Getting Harry Byrne into the squad, Robert Balakoon from Ulster. I think he's someone who just has incredible X factor and finishing ability. Um, and there's a lot of other young players, you know, Ryan Baird, can he challenge for that second row spot, get more depth there. Another area probably is, you know, for Ronan Keller's development. I think Rob Herring has been brilliant, but he's not a, you know, he hasn't effectively, you know, made ball carries. But I watched back in the game a couple of times, and in fairness to Rob Herring, didn't make a lot of carries, but he he's he's work around the field and the fitness and the clearing out and rocks and the supporting players being first or second player in there to clear out a rock was was phenomenal. His work rate is through the roof and the lineouts um, darts were really good. You know, probably the loose head loose head spot is another area that you know unfortunately for for uh, Dave Kilcoyne he went off so early we didn't get to see the best of himself there and, and on, on Saturday but Keane Healy was was really good when he came on so look every team can go through positions probably the the, the areas that we we really need to address are 9 and 10 so it's in an ideal world in the next phase or year year and a half before the World Cup is having you know, a lot of young exuberance coming through into the squad and talent. And there's a fair bit of talent out there, but um, it doesn't make everything perfect now that we, we beat England because Scotland beat England as well. Wales beat England. So um, England have been shockingly bad. Um, and they really surprised me on Saturday because I think last week and, you know, their finish in that second half against France was very impressive. So, um Still plenty to work on for sure. And if I was Andy Farrell, I'd be trying to see who's the next line or list of players that we can bring in and, and have a look at. Is Eddie Jones still the right man to coach England? Well, they say he is, but I, I think tactically England are very, very blunt. Um, they kick the letter off the ball. They try to overpower teams. And, you know, the game evolves uh, every couple of years, Ger, Um you know, teams probably are figuring out what Ireland experienced two years ago against England in the first game of the Six Nations 2019, um, where England just smothered Ireland into submission, um, overpowered them and, and kicked a lot. And they play, they try and play in the opposition half and force mistakes. They've got to add a little bit more. You've probably one of the best wingers in the world in Johnny May, and he's probably not getting the ball enough. Um, I really thought it was telling on Saturday when, when at one stage in the second half, um, Ben Young's just box kicked the ball up the middle of the field. Um, I was really shocked and surprised at that. You're chasing a game and you're just kicking it away. Um, so it sh it shows that you know when you're out in the field and the, the pressure there, you kind of go back to the safety net of well, this is what we're used to. So England kicked the ball a huge amount as well. Doesn't take away from the fact that Ireland overkicked the times in in in, in those early games as well, um, but is he the right man for the job? I think he there's way more pressure on him now, and I think, but there seems to be a patience there and a, and uh, that look and we can't get carried away with this because England will learn a lot from this. I think they 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 probably need to make some changes and look at the more senior players as well. They'll always have a conveyor belt of players coming through because of the depth chart they have. But um, he's under pressure now. But it depends what happens in the summer, you know, and what happens next November with internationals and stuff. But if they go on a run of losing matches, I think people will lose patience with him. Uh, on Wales then, Alan, uh, I mean, the the team of the tournament really uh, and uh, to lose the Grand Slam in such a manner would be absolutely gut-wrenching from their perspective. Could they have done anything more? Let's let's start with that perspective. Could they have done anything more with the clock in the red and, and France bearing down on them at the weekend? I think it's the pe penalties they gave away, but it's easy to kind of just pick the penalties and say, um, say that uh, you can avoid them. They're very, very difficult. I think they tried to be cynical. Uh, Liam Williams tried to get back on his feet, and I look back on that when he got yellow carded 
Um, and it was harsh. It was harsh. The game went crazy, didn't it, in the last kind of 10 minutes. And But up to that point, for 70 minutes, Wales were, were brilliant. I think the reaction, the scores they got, the way they played, um, and they really believed they could win. But France are just sensational, I think. they And, and surprisingly, their composure and their control against everything that was going on with the Willems send, sending off, um, the ball being knocked on, they're losing it in contact. You, you know, Wales had the ball at the end, and we give out about... Uh, we questioned Jamison Gibson Park kicking the ball away in the 78 minute last week. Wales held on to it, and Corey Hill goes off his feet, and they get penalised for sealing off. There's always a chance that that will happen. Um, when I think of the sealing off right at the end of the game, you go back to 2013 when Ireland were ahead against New Zealand, and Nigel Owens penalised Jack McGrath for going off his feet, rightly so, and New Zealand scoring in the corner. It, was, it reminded me of that. Wales had the ball. They just probably had a minute, over a minute to play it out, and uh, they give away the penalty. And then France, the execution for that try at the end was was sublime. The way Gail Fiku kind of straightened, hesitated for a sec, held the Welsh defence, gave the pass then, and Doulan scored was was sensational. It was it was unbelievable. But you have to feel for Wales. They did so much right in that game, and were so close to probably to winning a Grand Slam that nobody would have predicted before the start of the tournament. I thought they, you know, and we all thought that they would really struggle, but they started well, uh, you know, getting the first two wins against the odds that they probably didn't deserve. And they, they, they improved so much throughout the tournament, but it was a crazy finish. And uh, I suppose justifiably so France, because I think they're such a good team. They're probably the team that should be going for a Grand Slam. They're the best team in the tournament, I think. I'm really, really devastated for poor Wales. I have so much sympathy coursing through every capillary of my blood this morning. It's a disaster. <laughs> it's terrible for them. They really, you know, they've been robbed. Fabian Galtier actually came out very, very interestingly and um, Pivac and, and his um, backroom team refused to comment on this because they were like, oh, look, I haven't seen the translation for this. But essentially, and Robbie, um, Reggie Corrigan was saying this in, in uh, commentary as well, like, the Welsh are very good at annoying the opposition to the point where the opposition have to feel like they have to do something illegal around the breakdown. Uh, the body language was what Galtier was talking about, getting uh, teams sent off. I've no doubt that it was a red card the other night, but it came at the end of, like, a 10-minute period where Wales had been offside, lying, not rolling out of the way, slowing everything down, and maybe that's why Williams ultimately gets a uh, yellow card. It's somebody else's yellow card. They're just giving it to him. But if, if there'd been a, a penalty given, that red card wouldn't have happened because the opportunity, the need to, to, uh, to roll um, from Willems, it wouldn't have happened. I can see why uh, teams get very upset playing against the Welsh. It's, it's genius dark arts when it works, but it's so on the edge that it can backfire against you in the last 10 minutes. Yeah, it can. But look, I think, Jared, most teams, if they're under that sort of pressure, would... would, would uh would be close to the edge there of trying to do something, come up with a play, and it's it's very very difficult in the heat at the moment. Well, Wales are very very competitive, and they've they've a lot of experienced players. And um, what would I do if I was a Welsh player? There, I'd be probably doing the exact same thing, trying to come up with a big play, and that's the chance you take. But um, they were probably, and again, don't give away a try, give away a penalty. I think you know that. Even though it's probably Alan Wynne Jones is not shutting that out, all the Welsh players know that. So that's that's good play if you're if you're on the Welsh side and and it nearly worked for them. Us having a conversation saying they're very cynical. I know Reggie was saying in commentary, it's probably apparent there and it would frustrate the life out of if you're if you're a French player or a French fan, but all teams can do that and, and know when to do that. But um they will get a reputation the now, though, because the the, the, the the coaching tickets week in, week out, and the advance with those meetings with the referees are going to be like, watch out for this, look at this. And I, I yeah, can and, see and it coming. The, the, the difference is now, Ger, a lot of this stuff has been really policed heavily now. The offside lines, the in from the side, the sealing off. Um, the Willems to clean out was very unfortunate. I think you've got to give credit to Wayne Barnes and Luke Pierce for picking it up. Barnes picked it up first. 
Um, I don't think there's no intention there. He tries to clear the player out. He's gone past him and puts the arm back to try and uh, move him out of the way. Fabian Galti is saying, I suppose, in the context of what he said, that they they tried to get players red cards. I think that's not the case. There's no way to do that. They do. They are cynical and they can really frustrate you, which can lead to the opposition getting frustrated. But you've got to keep your discipline at that level. And um, you just felt at times that nothing was going right for France, that uh, last-ditch tackles, holding players up, they were saving the day. And again, they had the job done. But Luke Pierce probably should have, um, before the Villam side, I do agree with that, he should have penalised earlier, blown it up for a penalty or a yellow card to one of the Welsh players there. Um, but overall, I think, look, as I said, I do the exact same myself. And Wales, Wales have been, you know, they've, of course, they're going to be competitive. They're going to be on the edge. They have to be. Yeah. They are, um, sorry, to just, be successful. And they've been absolutely brilliant. Their skill level under execution, the discovery of new talent, the ability to merge that old team with those young players has been absolutely sensational. Wales are reborn yeah. and are now, I would argue, one of the most dangerous teams in world rugby. The, the, the worst takeaway about this from the Six Nations from an Ireland perspective is we all feel like we're finishing on a bit of a high, but it's been a sensational France performance where all their flakiness is gone and Wales are absolutely amazing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And that's why the game was so good. The way Wales approached that game the other night, they didn't try and contain France. They, they kept playing and believed they could attack them and, and uh, take them on. And they did that brilliantly. You know, with, when France had 15 players in the field, they, they, were, they had them under massive pressure. So they've grown in confidence. And top players, then look at George North, the way he's played throughout the tournament. So many question marks about his form. Reece Samet has been the find of the season for any team. I think he was, you know, if I was picking a line team now, he's he's starting straight away. He's yeah. sensational. Jonathan Davies coming back from long term injury. Dan Bigger, who I know well, he's a real warrior. You you know, he's kind of like Sexton Farrell with the temperament. Question marks about him. He's been brilliant for him. The competitive edge of him. Tipperick, you know, uh, Josh Navidi, Falato, I thought was 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 incredible the other night. Um, so good for, for Wales um, the other night. Alan Jones had a great tournament. Ken Owen. So they're all big players who found form. And when they put on that Welsh jersey, we've said it so many times over the years, they, they just come together and um, they're top quality players. And you're picking a Lions team now, there's a good few Welsh players in it because um, their consistency throughout the tournament and, and the ability to get the job done. Incredibly unfortunate. But the impressive thing, as I said, for France was their composure they usually capitulate when they're under that sort of pressure and all that kind of stuff is going wrong. So it was incredibly impressive at the end, the way they were able to keep going, get those late two, those two late tries and, and win the game. Um, they probably should have beaten England last week as well. They didn't have that kind of ability to see out the game um, from Jolly Bear last week um, and DuPont himself. But... France have been the best team. They've probably been the team that um, have impressed me most. And I think they're going to be such a threat if, if Galtier can keep these guys together and on the right track for, for 2023 at the World Cup. Yeah, um, and it's, uh, it's great that we're slated to meet them as well. Alan, good stuff. Thanks a million. Cheers. We'll talk to you during the week. Cheers, lads.